done this with a, and I think it's, it's uh, like you say, it makes the screen so much bigger. And uh, if you can manipulate it so it's no Yeah, we'll see what we can do to get, right? the, get the projector back. Oh, well, these are the Dario's pictures. Yeah, he did those pictures and he, he uh, we blew them up uh, and he just said, hey, keep them. Uh, oh, so we've, uh, it's turned out to be a real windfall for us because it fills in the theater. Yeah. And uh, everybody has a hoot looking at something uh, that they remember. Yeah. Now tell us about Julius Stryker. Stryker, revolting little man. And uh, his, he was a newspaper editor, and you wondered why in the world he was there among the leaders of the Nazi party, but he was so revolting that they decided to try him, and everybody hated him so, and he reveled in the idea that he was included as a leader. So he wasn't going to give that, that promotion up for anything, and was hanged for it. Perfectly willing to do it, because it, it documented the fact that he was, he was one of the leaders. Right. And uh, he was so awful that uh, he'd been casting aspersions on Goering's ability to have children after Goering had this one baby. And uh, uh, Goering literally would have killed him without any doubt. And Hitler interceded because Hitler loved these uh, terrible Jewish caricatures that Spricker printed in his uh, uh, newspapers. So he, he kept him alive and kept him with him. And uh, Stryker loved it. And he did all sorts of weird things. Uh, among, among them was the fact that after he, he was taking English lessons, and um, he spoke a little pidgin English, but he was taking lessons. And uh, then somebody said to him, well, Stryker, you know, you're going to be hanged in 10 more days. Why do you continue the English lessons? Well, he said, well, don't you know that in uh, heaven they speak English? And uh, fellow thought about that a minute, and he said, well, Stryker, suppose you go the other way. He said, oh, that's all right, I already speak French. <laughs> <laughs> he was a clever little character, and we had a very Jewish psychiatrist uh, among our staff, and uh, uh, he uh, paid a lot of attention to Stryker one time, because he said Stryker could appear in court and not have a heart attack, and then the psychiatrist got worried that he would have a heart attack, and he'd get blamed. <laughs> so. He uh, watched Stryker very carefully. Stryker appreciated that, and so that he made this very affectionate greeting in, in inscribing a book to this psychiatrist, which embarrassed the life out of him, because this psychiatrist was a good New York Jewish boy. <laughs> we kidded him from then on about Stryker, his great friend. But uh, his name was Goldenson. I remember operating on his father one time. <laughs> but you know, Stryker was a... a, a had these awful, awful uh, things in his newspaper that were of oh, no value whatsoever except to Hitler, who loved him. And uh, everybody else was willing to kill him. But he got himself right in the middle of it and savored every minute of it. We have a picture here in color of Albert Speer. I think yeah. you're... Speer, Speer. I thought that Speer should never, never have been uh, uh, punished. Uh, he turned against... Uh, he was taken in by Hitler, as they, as they all were, and uh, he did marvelous things for war production, but you know, he used to hang somebody for being a war producer. And uh, to be sure, they used uh, slave labor probably in some of those plants, but not at his particular request. And uh, uh, he improved the output of German fighter planes every day, even though we bombed his factories every night, and uh, did wonders for them. And at the end, when Hitler ordered all of the public works destroyed that would have made a, a, a jungle out of uh, Germany, uh, he, he, he stopped it. He, he had great risk to himself. He did not follow Hitler's orders. He said, I've arranged it, but he didn't do it. And then at the end, he even tried to kill Hitler. Well, this man, I didn't think, should have been imprisoned at all. And yet they gave him, what, 20 years in prison? 20 years. And, uh, he worked hard at doing his publishing all until that time, but uh, uh, he himself said, no, we should share the blame because we all were, were equally guilty of, of supporting the idea in the beginning. But I thought, no, I thought this is a bad 
example to put up of somebody who did turn against evil and, and yet we punished him. And uh, so I know people think the opposite, but that was my view of listening and talking to him personally. He would do things for other people. I mean, he designed a little, a little uh, monogram for for Eva Braun, and uh, he did all sorts of nice little things. And at the trial, if you know, they, they had this four language translation of technical material, and the interpreters would fumble over various things, and he would lean forward and look at the interpreters and shake his head no, <laughs> and they quickly correct it. Or if they didn't get it right, he'd write him a little note, pass it down to him, say it should be so and so. And he was helpful and pleasant, and I thought that they made a terrible mistake in punishing somebody for turning over to the right side. But that was my view of it. Did he also give you some, one of the first guys to give you some idea that Hitler had some, had Parkinson's, or had, had a sort of sense of uh, mortality? Oh, indeed. He, uh, he was very, he surprised me by dwelling on the fact that Hitler was preoccupied with an early death. And well, I, you know, that didn't impress me too much because we were all, all there trying to kill Hitler and his own people turned against him as they found out at the last July there with a bomb plot. And uh, uh, he himself uh, uh, tried to kill Hitler uh, by putting poison gas down the air intake in the bunker, but they foiled him because Hitler had blocked it off. But uh, uh, he, he spoke about that so many times, and it came up so often in conversing about Hitler, uh, that I was very impressed. Well, I didn't realize at the time what the reason for that was, because in retrospect, somebody had told Hitler that he only had a couple more years to live, because his Parkinson's disease was progressing very steadily and very seriously at the end. And uh, uh, this, the uh, wasn't known at the time. They kept it a great secret. They kept it a secret not only from us, but from the German people. And the man who was the guard in or in charge of the guard at uh, Berchtesgaden, the big, uh, the Berghof, the big house in Berchtesgaden, ran into Hitler one evening when they neither of them knew the other was there. And this man looked at Hitler and realized he was talking to a dying man. And he realized too that this had been kept a secret from the German people and uh, was, was shocked at this. And then in talking to others of them, well, you, it became apparent that Hitler was indeed dying. And he was dying, of, as it turns out now, of a, a type of Parkinson's disease that progresses much more rapidly than the ordinary type because he probably had had encephalitis at the end of World War I. He went blind, and after, after a while he went blind again. He blamed it on being gassed by, with chlorine gas by the Brits, but. Uh, uh, and he might have gone blind once, but he wouldn't go blind again. Mm -hmm. And that's at the time when the virus diseases first hit us hard. I mean, polio came to the fore. Uh, millions of people died from influenza, and, uh, and encephalitis became a, an entity. And his history was such that he almost certainly, according to the experts in this field, uh, had post-encephalitis Parkinson's that was moving very fast at the end. It started out with a paralysis of his left hand. And uh, I had in my book, uh, we have a picture of uh, 20 or so pictures of mm -hmm. Hitler. Each time he's holding his left hand with his right, or he's gripping something with his left hand, which would stifle the, the uh, dreamer. And then we finally, at the end, uh, when the censorship began to break down, a Scandinavian newsreel crew got a picture of his left hand where he shows the typical pill-rolling dreamer of Parkinson's. And there's no doubt what he had. And uh, it moved so fast that uh, it's, it's very probable he was uh, aware that he didn't have much time to live, and somebody probably told him very clearly. And that's why when he had the British defeated at, uh, at Dunkirk, he could have walked across the channel, and nobody with no opposition, the Brits admitted that, and taken over England. The British would have moved their government to the Bahamas. We would have compromised with the Germans the way Stalin had compromised with them, the French had compromised with them, and, and Hitler could have had it all his own way. Yeah. But he had made the promise that he was going to conquer Europe, including Russia, by force. And uh, uh, in view of that fact, he went ahead and attacked Russia before he was ready and lost. Thank goodness. Well, the reason he did it was because of the Parkinson's disease and the fact that he then somebody told him that he's 
his, his time was limited. So my belief is that, and then Spear, as I say, was the one that brought it to my attention by his emphasis and uh, repeated reference, reference to the uh, fact that uh, Hitler had been preoccupied with his early death. I think that's very true, and I think it's been, we've missed it in, in trying to account for Hitler's bad judgment and, well, first of all, letting his, his uh, army be captured in, uh, in uh, Stalingrad, which was a, a turning point against him, and for doing foolish things like the Battle of the Bulge, where uh, he swore to uh, Speer that the reason he did that was that if he had a victory under his belt, then he could sue for peace with more, uh, more chance of success. And uh, so Speer went along with it, as all the rest of them did. And of course, it, it cost them all their reserves. They had no reserves left after that. And uh, from then on, it was a walkover. But in any case, it all fitted together. And my belief is uh, very firmly that uh, uh, our success was partly due to Hitler's Parkinson's. That's incredible. Um, also in your book, you're, you're quite I don't want to use the term sympathetic, but you appreciate Yodel in your book. Uh, Yodel. As... Yodel was, I mean, the, the, in, in retrospect, they had two leading Navy people and two leading Army people, and they let the two Navy people off. And uh, uh, you can argue in favor or against all of them. And I, in fact, asked various of the judges why that was, how that came to be. And, and the answer that I got from, from uh, some of our people was that uh, uh, the, the crimes of the army are right there on land where you can document them, and the crimes of the navy were at sea where you couldn't really reinforce the documentation, and that was a reason perhaps. But uh, my own belief is that Yodel was a, was a, a technician, and uh, of course that was their one of the big aspects of the trial is that we did not accept uh, uh, higher authority as being an excuse for crimes of, uh, against humanity. And uh, it's true enough, but uh, it was, as I say, if you're going to be even-handed about it, you should have been punished the, the, the admirals just as severely as they did the generals. And I thought that Yodel was a particularly good example of a technician who did technical things and did them very well. But that was his job. Yeah. But I say that was my view. The uh, army did very well by its uh, soldiers in, in providing medical support. And when uh, Pearl Harbor occurred, all the doctors volunteered. And in the, as an example, the, the Normandy campaign that I was involved in, they moved large numbers of army hospitals to England to receive the casualties that we knew we were going to have. And uh, each of those hospital units had a thousand beds and personnel to run them. And uh, you knew that if you had a wound, if you saw that big ambulance with that big red cross on it, you knew you were going to get good medical care because every one of those hospitals had a brain surgeon for bullet wounds of the head. Uh, they had a, a chest surgeon for bullet wounds of the chest and heart. They had an abdominal bowel surgeon for belly wounds. Uh, a urologist for your urological wounds, and orthopedists, of course, uh, were the most uh, needed. And uh, uh, the system worked. And in every one of the invasion ports where the uh, landing craft left for, for Normandy came back, uh, or was receiving back, uh, empty uh, uh, invasion craft uh, loaded with, with uh, casualties. And they had hospital trains going directed to each one of these big hospitals or an ambulance uh, route and uh, they were they worked very very well uh, and everybody got very good care right from the beginning long-term care they put them on planes and brought them back to the states but uh, the system worked out very well indeed and so I was in that in that group and on D-Day uh, when we put over these thousands and thousands of youngsters onto unprotected beaches and got mowed down by the Germans, I think that uh, we, we succeeded only when the Germans ran out of ammunition because they just, just, just murdered us. And uh, uh, when they were uh, uh, brought back uh, and, and taken care of in this way, uh, it, it worked out 
as I say, very well. Then when we got established uh, and were able to bring hospital units over to France, uh, we were able to leapfrog ahead and uh, uh, then we brought over Patton, whom we'd used as a decoy. Uh, it worried Hitler to the point that Hitler thought that the Normandy invasion was a fake. They thought we were saving Patton to go across at the Pas de Calais and uh, uh, instead he came after we were ashore in, in Normandy and uh, uh, did his, uh, his best from there on. And you'll see in the presentation a, a photograph of Patton urinating in the Rhine River as he promised he would do. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be the first. <laughs> now, did you, uh, did, were you in a field hospital then in France? No, no, I was a general hospital. General hospital? I was a surgical specialist. And a surgical, everybody had a number in the Army. And your, your, your uh, post was determined by your So you, went, you were started in England, then you went to France? Yeah. And, but on D-Day, uh, we put over, I understood, there were 40 tanks that had a flotation collar on them. We were supposed to have them float until they got in close enough to hit the dirt. Right. Well, they all sank, except for a, a few. I remember seeing two. And the problem was that being the only cover, you looked ahead and there was all this perfectly bare space that you had to walk across. And the Germans had that covered with what we call raising interlocking curtains of fire. And that meant that every inch of that beach was covered by some type of, of projectile. And there was no way to escape it. And uh, uh, these kids would get in behind these two tanks and for cover, and the shell fragments go under the tanks and cut off their legs. And I had three, at one point, three cots with, with three men. Were all that were left of a company of 300 combat engineers. And they were congratulating each other they, none of them had any legs from below the knee. And uh, they were congratulating each other because they were still alive. All their other friends were dead. Well, in any case, it was a, it was a rough day, a rough day. When and did you get to France yourself? Well, then I went back with, with the first loads. And then it was, oh, it was a month or so before my whole unit, as a unit, was transferred to France. Where were you stationed in France? Well, we were stationed first in... Uh, in uh, Oh, St. Mary's and uh, what's the town uh, right near the, the coast? The reason I'm, I'm, I'm asking you is that I, a woman, and I not, she's not living anymore, was in, I think, the 683rd hospital in Garsh. Did you ever end up in Garsh outside of Paris? No. You no, didn't? Okay. No. No, I got to Paris, and well, I'll show you, I guess, in the presentation, I'll show you the medal I got from the French Army for Captain releasing, relieving Paris. But uh, I got there and I had, you know, each of us had a, a prison ward with German officers. And uh, this one German Luftwaffe uh, man said, you know, when you get to Paris, you ought to immediately go. He knew that I was looking for, you know, good places to set up and uh, go to this certain hospital that we, the German Luftwaffe, have rehabilitated and rebuilt. And it's brand new and you'll love it and you can make that your headquarters, your urology headquarters. And uh, so I thought, you know, this is great. So as soon as I could, I got a Jeep and I rushed off to this place and here was this beautiful building and I thought, oh, I was going to see, you know, headquarters, ETO, urology, <laughs> faculty. And, uh, uh, the big glass door opened and out walked my orthopedic friend, he, <laughs> <laughs> Frank Stinchfield. He was the uh, world's top orthopedist at the time, and uh, he beat me to it. But uh, in any case, uh, then we moved on to Germany, and you know, I was in Kassel for a while, you know, occupying uh, von Rundstedt's old headquarters, and. Uh, uh, well, then you got to the ash can from there somehow to Luxembourg. No, then, right? then, no, 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 then we went on and on and on, and I ended up in Berkersgaden. And then I was brought back to Munich, where we took over a big German civilian hospital in the northern suburb of Schwabing. And uh, you'll see pictures of it. And uh, big, beautiful buildings, and all connected with, with runways to the operating rooms or in one building and wide open, so on rainy days they would bring their gurneys with the patient through the rain into the operating room and then back to their beds through the rain. First thing we did was cover all the things. Well, in any case, uh, uh, this is a beautiful building 
And we had a big going concern there, big thousand, two thousand bed hospital. But by that time, things were beginning to lighten up because the Japanese, well, first of all, we were they're pulling stuff, people out to fight the Japanese, well, then the Japanese surrendered. But uh, uh, our chaplain, our whatever the Germans have as a chaplain, uh, was, was uh, requisitioned to become the chaplain, the Protestant chaplain for the Germans, for the prisoners at Ashkan. And uh, he came back almost immediately to pick up some things and he said, boy, you got to come up and see this with me. So the next time he went back, I rode back with him and uh, they loved him. I mean, they, they were so appreciative of him that they would... That he, and he had, he had been a German chaplain. Or we, was no, he, a he was chaplain? an American Army chaplain. Okay. Yeah. But he could speak German. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he was got along with them very well, and they they liked him. They petitioned his wife by mail to let him stay, even though he had enough points to go home. So he stayed on, and I guess till he walked him to the gallows. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was a Cherokee, and uh, he wrote articles for the Saturday Evening Post and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, it worked out worked out very well and I was delighted because they loved him. They thought, boy, this, this, is, uh, this is somebody you know, who's got our interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Goering would say, oh, anything you want to talk about, he'd pat the bed and say, sit down, hair doctor. And, well, he'd always call you a hair colonel even you were a hair merger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he'd yak away at anything you want to talk about, tell you all about it. and. Uh, uh, by that, that I knew Lindbergh, and I knew Lind I saw Lindbergh appear in Paris. This is after Franklin and Roosevelt had died, and uh, uh, the people had let up on, on Lindbergh because it was obvious that Lindbergh was over there at the request of our army. It was what he was doing in Germany, and he was coming back. They would not only show him their airplanes, they let him fly them. I said, how did you dare fly that ME-109 with the experimental prototype and, and with a very narrow landing gear, a lot of trouble. And he said, well, if you remember, where I knew him was at Selfridge Field in Michigan. He was a fighter pilot after his famous flight. His mother was a school teacher in, in Detroit. And uh, uh, he picked a couple of us kids up walking down to the air base and uh, his tousle-headed flyer, you know, and we got out to the line and here he was putting bombs on the underwing of his fighter plane to do, it was for skip bombing, which was, he invented. And uh, uh, this kid with us said, you know who that is? That's Lindbergh. And I said, you're kidding. <laughs> but he's the one who had given us a lift down to the place. Well, in any case, then I got to know him, and later on I was his doctor. And uh, he was, <laughs> he was uh, full of, of great information about uh, the, the German fighter planes. And his, his wife was brought up in the same town in, in New Jersey as, as I live in now, and used to play in my house when I was a child. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we, we had a, a lot of good times together, but uh, well, that's a, so. Uh, did you end up officially going to uh, Ashcan? Yes, as a doctor. Well, I went as a doctor, not to Ashcan. I was only as a visitor, uh -huh. but uh, as a guest of the. Right. Of but then, the because of your relationship with this chaplain, you ended up going to Nuremberg as right, a doctor. Right, right, right. They moved him to Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. And uh, by that time, it was obvious that they not only had uh, uh, needed medical support, they needed urolog ur urologists. Uh, um, two of them had bad symptoms uh, um, of the banker, uh, four-letter word. Funk. Walter mm -hmm. Funk? Funk. Yeah. Funk was a weird-looking little guy, and he was full of uh, old gonorrheal strictures and, and good cheer. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I couldn't couldn't have and didn't have any idea where all those gold fillings came from. <laughs> and uh, he was having terrible trouble uh, urinating. So, uh, and the, the German doctor we had taken care of him had been a urologist, but uh, he didn't have any instruments. So I got him some instruments. So of course, every time he'd dilate Funk, this was before antibiotics, you know. So Funk could spike a fever of 106 <laughs> and be out for a couple of days, but he could pee again. And, uh, <laughs> so we got along, and uh, uh, Funk eventually came to a prostate operation, but that was a couple of years after I'd left, after they moved him up to Berlin. And uh, then he was back at, 
at war back in, in prison in, in a week, and the Germans wouldn't believe it. Nobody heard of a transurethral resection. And, the, and of course, the Russians wouldn't believe it at all. <laughs> and uh, uh, then the admiral, uh, oh dear, the one that was, that was made the successor to... Donuts. Donuts. Donuts decided he'd have the operation, too. It was that quick and easy. So they called one of my colleagues, uh, a senior person from Washington, to go over and do his resection. And he was very appreciative and used to still write us notes about how appreciated he much he appreciated. And, uh, uh, well, as I say, everybody has urological problems somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. And uh, so they needed somebody, and uh, I was delighted. And uh, got to... With, with this kind of support, and, and the other person that was, uh, was very helpful is the fellow you've had as a speaker, Dola Boys, yeah. Yeah. who uh, one day appeared, uh, and he was a clerical officer of some sort, and Goering got the idea that he was representing the Geneva Convention to be sure that they were treated right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he was very, uh, Goering was very... Uh, uh, Anxious to make friends with Dola Boy. And well, Dola Boy basically said he just played dumb. That's yeah. They thought he was the welfare officer. Exactly, exactly. They thought he was a, a representing the mm -hmm. the uh, the do-gooders that were supposed to be so mm -hmm. they were supposed to be treated right, and so they all did very well with by him. <laughs> and uh, he went. They went right along. They changed his name to whatever it was Goring called him, and. Uh, I uh, forgot what you... Gillen. 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 Lieutenant Gillen. Yeah. <laughs> well, then he did indeed join the counterintelligence uh, corps because of this contact, and he drove several of the generals all over Europe to, the, to go visit their homes and things like that, even though they were still indicted and might be tried or maybe were tried. But uh, after the first couple of trials, you know, the whole thing disintegrated. I mean, the punishment they handed out was nothing. Uh, so that... The whole idea of, of, of killing them off of, mm -hmm. faded away. But of course, we were in the Cold War, and there was pressure to get it done and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you get a chance to meet all the defendants? Then? Yeah, yeah. And did you Did you meet Robert Jackson? No, I didn't. I didn't meet the the staff. They were sort of a, uh, you know one layer above layer above the common man, and mm -hmm. uh, very we had very little contact with them. There was a officers club in the in, in the hotel and uh, they would have receptions and you'd see them there mm -hmm. but in, I never got to know any of them. No, I, I, Jackson was just a, a an authority figure and he was so, oh, I started to say domineering, but he dominated the courtroom so so vigorously that you sort of hesitated to to assume that you would get any kind of a in a response to ordinary conversation with him, and uh, he was, was he respected by the people that worked there? Oh yeah, oh yeah. He the whole thing was due to him. If it hadn't been for him, it would have been no trial. I mean, it would have been travesty. Uh, what uh, was it? Uh, Churchill that wanted to hang fifty thousand right. of them or something like that. And, uh, and even while, while Bill Donovan wanted a quick hurry up kind of trial, and Jackson and just said, "No, we have enough documents to." Convict them all, basically. Well, yeah. it, uh, uh, it it seemed to me that without him, there'd have been no 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 the reproduction of, of documents was 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 crucial, mm -hmm. and there'd have been nobody. And he had the power to get our army to contribute the manpower to reprint all these things. And every day, this pile of sheets of paper was over your head. Hmm. It was it was astounding. They they did it deliberately to show you <laughs> what they did. And uh, everything they did had to be translated into four languages, and every little scrap had to be translated. And then after the testimony, everything that was said that day had to be test had to be uh, transcribed in and tra translated. And did I tell you before about Speer? He one of the things he would do. As he'd listen to what was going on, and the, the interpreters had fumbled something, uh, some technical point, and he'd lead forward and he'd say no, and they'd figure out what it was and change it. Well, if they still got it wrong, he'd get out a note and run them, pass them down a little note, straighten them out. But this is all, <laughs> all voluntary work for him, mm. but he was glad to do it and uh, and did it very well, very very you know without 
particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, thought of reward. And uh, he was a very nice guy, and he made all sorts of, well, for, for Eva, Braun, he uh, designed a little monogram for her, he put her two initials back to back to make a butterfly, mm -hmm. E and B, uh, and uh, she was very, very appreciative of his services. And uh, I have a little Parisian handbag of hers that has mm -hmm. this EB monogram on the inside, thanks to him. Right, no. And, uh, Did you get started on that collection when you were over there? I've seen your, I've read your book. Yeah, I've seen yeah. well, partly I discovered that the government, well, partly when the men were hanged, they left a lot of stuff in the baggage room. And that was quickly parceled out among the staff. And the, the, the first sergeant, or the, not the first sergeant, but the commander of the guard, uh, was a Lieutenant Wheelis we were talking about. And uh, he had survived the, the goings home and, and ended up as the, the top man. And he was in charge of the baggage room. And in the baggage room, there was a list of all the stuff that they left. Well, among the things that, uh, that uh, uh, Yaring left was a, was a chronometer, a wristwatch. And you know, in the old days, you flew with a stopwatch. You had a stopwatch that had three different dials, and ahead of time, you figured out how many seconds you would fly on such and such a compass bearing, and then you at such and such a speed. And then you'd change to the second bearing and fly so many seconds. So this wristwatch made all that easy before radio uh, navigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a beautiful watch with his name on the back. And it's listed in the inventory of his things that were in the baggage room. and the, man in charge of the baggage room, this Lieutenant Wheelis, uh, was a hunter from Texas and, and Nuring was the head huntsman of the Third Reich and uh, made a lot of, of that with, with uh, old uh, Wheelis and they chatted together. And uh, uh, so he was giving Wheelis things, sub, sub, not subterraneously, but mm -hmm. surreptitiously, uh, to get in Wheelis's good graces because what he wanted was the ability to get at his skin cream, which was in jars in his baggage. And when we got him, he weighed 300 pounds. Titler turned on him, he'd, he'd begun to gain weight, and his thighs were so big, they rubbed together, rubbed the skin off. It was intertrigo, it's a well-known phenomenon. Well, uh, it was so bad that he needed the skin cream, no doubt about it. So he brought these two stainless steel bucket uh, things, uh, full of opaque skin cream, and in them, unbeknownst to us, were buried two ampules of cyanide in their protective covers. I'm sorry I didn't bring mm -hmm. it, there was a picture of it. Yeah. Right. That's a cut-off rifle cartridge case and the one cc ampule of cyanide was inside. And he had a third one when he came, which he put in a jar of coffee crystals, which we found right away. Well, everybody relaxed, we'd found it. They all had them. And uh, nobody knew he had these other than skin cream. So he wanted to be able to get at the skin cream anytime he needed it to, to kill himself. And he decided finally, he thought he was going to be banished like the Kaiser, you know. And uh, when he finally decided we were indeed going to hang him, uh, he asked for his skin cream and, and Wheelis let him have it. And he dug one of those ampules out and two hours before the hanging time started, he bit it and he was dead, poof, like that. And uh, uh, yeah, I have the empty cyanide capsule container he had in his hand when he died. So you got some of this stuff from Wheelis then, huh? Wheelis is widow. His oh. widow, yeah, we talked about that early. He, he <laughs> wouldn't do it, but his widow was, there was a, another Texan uh, friend of mine that mm -hmm. uh, made a business of pursuing all these people and seeing if they had any relics, and sure enough, in Wheelis's case, he came up with his wristwatch and two or three other things. And uh, uh, then he got the ampule, the suicide containers, ampule containers out of the, one of the judges, one of the Judge Advocate General's officers that had it as part of the exhibits for the trial. And you keep this stuff all in one place? At home, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it, no, a lot of us is out on loan to uh, uh, presidential museums now are bugging me all the time for examples of this and that. See, what we see, we see in the book rally is the Nuremberg stuff. This is just a small portion of mm -hmm. one unbelievable collection mm -hmm. that Dr. Yeah. Latimer's put together. This now, look is, at this. I did wear Goring's ring. That's a seal that's upside down and backwards. Hmm. Uh, wow. And, uh, Where'd you get that? Well, that he left behind the same way. But all, a lot of the other things of his, 
were confiscated by the German government and sold at auction at some of the big German auction houses. And again, I had some friends that had made a, their life work hmm. pursuing these things, and they had them, and they sold them to me for money. And I, luckily, had come back and had gotten going very well in New York and uh, had enough means to be able to buy a few things. The, the person that worried me the most was the Forbes boys, uh, Father Forbes, well, Father Forbes was uh, the, the spark plug behind it, had infinite money, and bought anything to pay it. And when I'd see at, at Sotheby's or Christie's, one of the, the, the oldest son appear in the back of the room, I'd say, uh-oh. <laughs> but they weren't interested in, in the assassination of Lincoln, for example, which I was. So they would buy other Lincoln things that pay any amount, and I would buy the things related to the assassination successfully. So in this case, uh, I could do reasonably well and, and did. But uh, it was a matter of luck wow. and a matter of being there on the ground at the time. And when the Germans began to sell them, I mean, when the German government confiscated them and began to sell them at auction in Germany, I had friends that were, that was their, their uh, not livelihood, but their uh, mm -hmm. uh, avocation to go to those auctions and buy everything they could, knowing they could sell a lot of it to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's how I got, I guess. Uh, uh, it's called the Evan Latimer Collection. It yeah, my your... daughter. Well, at my age, you can't own anything. Mm -hmm. The IRS will kill, kill, kill <laughs> them when you die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't own anything. Uh, my, my kids own everything. Did and you, uh, uh, back back to the trial, did you attend many of the court hearings themselves? Did you, were you curious? Well, when you say money, no, because they were dull as mud, a lot of them. <laughs> uh, because the, uh, well, Goering would insist on, on listening to the entire translation before he would say yes or no. And the English judge would get mad at him and he would say, come on, Goering, you speak English perfectly well, answer the question. And Goering uh, would just ignore him. And then after this lengthy, lengthy uh, uh, interpretation, he'd say, nine. <laughs> 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 but uh, that, that went on, you know, for hour after hour. It was, it was really boring as all get out a lot of the time. Were you there when Goering was cross-examined? I think for a couple of sessions, yes. Yeah. And I, frankly, I thought Jackson made a mistake in mm -hmm. trying to handle it himself. Because uh, uh, German is uh, uh, loaded with double entendre. And uh, for example, uh, there's a, there was rumor that Goering's pregnancy uh, that finally occurred, when they got him off the drugs, you know, you're, you're impotent when you're on drugs. And he was on morphine after getting shot from they tried to take over the Bavarian parliament. And uh, his wife at that time, he got this uh, Swedish countess to divorce her husband, but she got TB and died before they could have any children. Well, then he married this very attractive German actress and, and, uh, got, uh, and at that, by that time he was off the drugs because the countess had put him in a, made him take on a spot in a German and in a Swedish insane asylum. And they put him on, on isolated uh, lock ward treatment and got him off it. And so he was off it when he married Emmy and, uh, and she got pregnant almost immediately. And uh, the, there was a, a comedian and, and, and our friend Stryker and his papers were saying, now if the baby is born, if it's a boy, they better rename him uh, uh, Hamlet because to be or not to be. Because in German, that means <laughs> is it your child or not your child? Yeah. Well, that kind of double entendre uh, uh, is very common in, in German, and, and Goering was a master of it, and he made a monkey out of various witnesses doing that, using that kind of, of tactic. And uh, uh, Jackson shouldn't have, shouldn't have tackled him. And the British were, were critical of, of Jackson for falling for them, then he'd get mad. And uh, uh, of course, that would blow everything up. So uh, it, I, I, think he made, he thought it, I thought he made a tactical mistake in, uh, in trying to cross-examine Gary. I thought he was great for the opening and closing statements and the summaries and that kind of thing. Uh, that, was, that was his fort, and, and I thought that he made a mistake in, in, in getting into areas where he was not uh, familiar. 
As you were looking down the dock, and obviously while you're in the prison, same folks, were there among the 21 defendants, the primary defendants, people you'd want to talk to? Or that you say, gee, I'd like to have an opportunity to spend some time with, you mentioned Albert Speer or anybody else, personalities that you were drawn to? Well, no, I think that Speer was the only, only one that you, that you really, there was something wrong with all the rest of them. Like, for example, Hess was really kooky, and the kid sitting behind Hess that was in charge of the, of the, of the youth, Hitler youth things. Uh, Chirac. He was uh, uh, brought up with an American mother, and he spoke American, he didn't speak English. And uh, uh, he would try and use it. He'd use slang or things that were seemed inappropriate uh, just because he knew them. And uh, you kind of disliked him because of this obvious uh, uh, double standard that he was uh, using. And uh, well, the rest of them, uh, uh, oh, the old lawyer. Von Poppen? Von pa no, no, Von Poppen was so cranky you couldn't get near him, but uh, uh, the one that came over here and got FDR to forgive their indebtedness, uh, he had an, an Ameri two American names, um, sat clear down at the end so he'd be away from all the rest of them. Uh, well, I say, older I get them. <laughs> Bad, worst my memory. Uh, not, not Ribbentrop. No, no, Ribbentrop, he was an empty vessel. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they all are contemptuous. Jackson said, and you, you had a head of a Gestapo who treated it some, so now says it was something like being a glorified traffic cop. Oh. <laughs> and you had the foreign minister who went around to embassies clipping ribbons, is all he, 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 he now says he did, right? Oh, he was, yeah, he was, he was a dud. But the guy I'm thinking of was, uh, <laughs> ja Shock. Jalmar Horace Greeley sure. Shock. Yes. He had American parents, and they, one of them was American anyway, and so they named him Horace Greeley. He was a cranky old bird. He said, I want nothing to do with these people. He said, I am not one of them. Uh, I have great contempt for all of them and I want to sit way down at the end as far as possible of all of them, and he did. And uh, he wouldn't speak to them, he wouldn't have anything to do with them, and uh, resented being in included among them. And I must say here again that I thought it was a stupid thing the way we did it, because we picked him up in Dachau. You'll see some pictures of Dachau. Well, I guess they're probably in here. Right. Bodies, you know, tons and tons of bodies. And he was one of them to be killed. And we tried him anyway. I thought that was stupid. Mm -hmm. And they can they, they he acquitted was acquitted, him. wasn't he? Yeah, but he was acquitted by a fluke. I mean, just because people disagreed over other things, uh, it, it it was not really on the on the, on the basis of, of facts at all. And uh, well, as I say, there are some things like that. And then the the radio announcer, Fritchie. Fritchie. Yeah, that they tried. Well, I thought that was stupid too, and they acquitted him. But uh, let's go back to Hess for a second. Yeah. What, what was your take on him? Did was he was there complete amnesia here? Uh, no, he was pretty well over the amnesia, uh, in my opinion. I from then on, I, I thought he was he was uh, what's the word uh, faking it uh, a lot of the time, and then of course they put him away. He was the only one left, and he had this little little hut out in the, in the yard, screen hut, and uh, uh, one day the nurses came back and found him dead, or almost dead, and he died almost right after. His, his, his son got a hold of me, knowing I'd taken care of him, and said, you know, you got to help me with this. And I said, well, what, you know, what can I do? And he said, well, I've had a second autopsy done, and, and you'll see it in my slides. The mark of the of the thing is goes straight around his neck is when you're garroted. Somebody had garroted him. He hadn't hanged himself, and uh, he he died. He didn't die at that moment, but he died a few hours later. And uh, uh, I said, well, uh, the United States authority on garroting versus hanging is so and so, and we'll get a hold of him. But this man said that well, when when you hang yourself, the rope comes up here and it doesn't hit your thyroid cartilage. 
But if you, somebody garrots you, it breaks the tips off your thyroid cartilage. It's a straightaway uh, uh, differential diagnosis. And his were broken off, just like if somebody garroted him. And the mark goes straight around his neck. And there's no doubt that he was garroted. And uh, they, he was on the British, uh, we took turns being his guards, and he was on the British rotation, and everybody thought that the Brits let their Secret Service people knock him off so he wouldn't say anything about what had been going on with him to try and get him to talk when they had him as a prisoner for what, four years. And uh, uh, in any case, I got a hold of our expert in this differential diagnosis, and he wasn't clear that he wanted to have anything to do with it, and he said, well, when you're 86 years old or whatever he was. 90, yeah. 90, he said, uh, your tissues are so brittle that that breaking off thing is not really a valid uh, basis for the only comparison. So I couldn't do much for him, but uh, my own opinion is that somebody did garrote him and kill him. Right. But he was, uh, as I say, I thought he was So they got into the prison somehow, right? To well, do it. it was, it, the British, the British Secret Trump. Service mm -hmm. had, had the prison under their guard during that time. And uh, so it would have been easy enough. Right. But the, the, the Russians, and he was the only prisoner left in Spandau, and of course there's a lot of money to, to guard it and keep sustain it, and uh, the Russians wouldn't give it up because every time they changed the guard, and it was their turn to march a, a guard unit in, they would put on a, did you ever see one of their, uh, the change the guard of the Kremlin? Oh yeah. And, and they come marching along, you know, the fancy, fancy goose step, holding this rifle straight up in the air, two of them, side by side, like two dolls. And uh, it's spectacular. <laughs> well, they would march one of these drill teams through the whole uh, British sector over to, over to the prison and uh, get a lot of cheers and support from all the spectators, and they didn't want to give that up. <laughs> so they didn't. <laughs> so we kept the darn prison open for, you know, years. Foolish. Kaltenbrunner. Uh, he was a, oh, he was a sad sack. He was uh, a coward. Uh, Any time that they were on the road and, a, and an enemy plane appeared, he would stop the car and get under the car and leave the wife and children in the car and uh, uh, not really make any room for them underneath. I mean, that was <laughs> typical of what he, of the, the stories we heard about him all the time. And he was a slovenly, disagreeable character, and you could believe everything bad that you heard about him, uh, which was that he was, you know, a toady and did anything he was told and denied responsibility for anything and denied that he signed any of those things that had his signature on them. And, and uh, uh, his arteriosclerotic brain finally caught up with him and he ruptured a couple of blood vessels in his brain and had uh, brief strokes that put him out of action for a little while, but then he came back and they finally hanged him, and I, I thought he deserved to be hanged. He was a no-gooder. Keitel. Keitel was an automaton, in my opinion. He, he was a typical German general that did everything he was told. Of course, that was one of the great things about they said about the trial, is that it, it no longer permitted you to use uh, a higher authority as an excuse for doing anything. And if that's true, then Keitel was a, a, a dud, but I, my own belief is that he was a, a non-contributor. Rosenberg. Oh, Rosenberg was a, a stupid <laughs> character that I don't see that he contributed much to the Nazi cause, but uh, uh, he was, you know, the, their, allegedly their idea man, and uh, not only admitted it, he boasted about it, to the point that I, I thought he deserved just what he got. Sokol. Who? Sokol. Sokol. Well, he had, when you saw the masses of people that he marched through that camp, those camps every day, thousands of them, you know, in a column of fours that was, went out of sight, it was so long, all going to labor at some kind of uh, factory. And uh, if they came back and they had a roll call and they'd say, now, am I correct? You've got 60 men on your, in your hut? And they'd say yes, and he'd say, well, tomorrow I want to see 40. Well, tomorrow there were 40. They let like 20 of them stand out overnight, and they were dead. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't die, they could get them, get, take a shower bath. And you'll see a picture of the Brausbad, 
and uh, it's a big room, not, well, this big, and uh, vents in the ceiling, and they let in live steam or cyanide gas, and everybody that was in there was packed in there, and they were all dead in a few minutes. And uh, he was in, well, his duty was just to marshal these thousands and thousands of, of foreign workers. And of course, that was a stupid thing anyway. I mean, here Speer was much smarter. He wanted them to let him have the workers work in their own home, where they could grow their own food and wouldn't break up the, the uh, food production in, in Germany. And uh, nobody would pay any attention to him. And uh, well, in any case, uh, Salko had all of these people that were decimated. If not quickly enough, then they would decimate him. What about Frank? Frank was a boasting, loud-talking, objectionable kind of a character. Uh, and he, he did what he said. I mean, he, he uh, was the boss. And I don't, I don't, it seemed to me that his, his connection was mostly verbal. And, uh, but it was deadly. I mean, it was uh, along the same lines of exterminating the population. And, uh, uh, but his, he didn't do it by direct contact with anybody. But he would argue, apparently, uh, successfully for anything that Hitler wanted. And Hitler used him all the time as his spokesman. And then as, when he was in Poland, he was there in charge when all of the Poles were massacred by the, by the German army. But it was just, it was just Hitler's organization that he was a man, a representative of, and deserved what he got. Did, did you ever talk to him about why he gave up his diary? No, no. He, uh, well, you mean he's, he's, he gave us his diary? Right, yeah, yeah. He just, yeah. Oh, gave it up. He just yeah. volunteered it. He just... No, no. He, he uh, was condemned by the rest of them as being stupid for doing it. Right. And, uh, they look at it two ways. I mean, he might have thought that maybe it would get him some compassion, but it didn't. Yes. I didn't. I don't know how he could figure it would, but that's the only reason I could think that's why he did it. But, how about Frick? Oh, a tough old bird, and uh, he was a, a scary kind of uh, of representative of the Nazis. Uh, he realized that here was somebody absolutely brutal. He would do anything, and uh, and did it very systematically. And he documented it well. And he wrote directors very well. And he wrote some of their famous directives. And uh, uh, he was. But when you talked to him, he was frightening. I mean, he was like he was like Frankenstein, and uh, uh, sort of like a mechanical monster. And uh, I can believe everything bad they said about him. Uh, he did order beautiful clothing. His clothing in the in the in the in the clothing room was was a beautiful quality, doeskin <laughs> things. But even Goering, who had beautiful clothing, didn't have them as fancy as Frick, which surprised me. But <laughs> that's life. <laughs> Von Neuroth, I know you have a picture that you probably show here of him putting his hand on Hitler, uh, and uh, Hitler looking at in a great deal of disgust. Oh. Yeah, yeah, he, he, and I think he made a great mistake at that, at that moment, he, <laughs> patting Hitler on the head, and uh, they're both wearing white tie and tails, and he's looking so much better than Hitler, <laughs> and, well, uh, oh, the one that went to England as an ambassador, uh, Ribbentrop, did the same thing. Mm -hmm. He had his picture taken with Hitler in a straight-cut military uniform, and Ribbentrop in a very gracefully cut Saville Rowe suit, and he makes Hitler look like a clod, and uh, I don't think that did him any good in the long run. But uh, uh, Norath was, uh, in that one picture of him doing that, uh, I can see that that terminated his <laughs> career as a, as a life representative for Hitler. Did von Poppen think he should not be there at all? Yeah, he, he just uh, wanted nothing to do with the rest of them. He wasn't one of them, them criminals, those criminals. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but uh, you know, and he'd gone from you know one job to another. What was he, the ambassador to Turkey or something? At, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at the end, well, but he'd been he'd been 
one of the one of the top officials of Germany before Hitler took over, and uh, he, he he was part of the old guard, and it, he he came very close to getting annihilated. I think when they did the house cleaning, but he escaped it, and then he went as the ambassador to Turkey and carried on on their side fairly well. You had a chance to interview Otto, Otto Scorzini. No. No, you did interview him? No, no, I didn't. I, I saw him, and uh, uh, then I followed his career in going to Madrid, and he died of uh, kidney trouble. And so I got to know more about that, rather indirectly, but uh, he was a giant of a man, and uh, uh, he was supposedly behind the uh, massacre in the Battle of the Bulge, wasn't he? Or he was the one? No, no, no. That was a different no, guy. No, he's the guy different. came in and, and rescued Mussolini. Yeah, yeah, but they, I thought he was involved in the Battle of the Bulge, dropping no. guys behind the lines there and in uh, American uniforms and stuff. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. He got he got American uniforms and uh, equipped a lot of his men as. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pseudo American soldiers, yeah, and uh, that's right. But he's the one that went down to rescue Mussolini, and he was so big that the pilot said, "I can't take you and Mussolini both." And but he climbed right in anyway, and they rattled downhill and over the edge and took off, <laughs> made it. But uh, he was—I have his big silver star on one of his decorations. Mm. But he was a great big powerful physically powerful man and dominant. Was it the Czechoslovakian government that he took over? He went in and rolled up the son of the prime minister in a roll of rug and carried him out? <laughs> Something like that. He didn't get, he wasn't at Nuremberg as a defendant, no. was he, Greg? No. He, he was there the, as a witness. Yeah, he wasn't there in the, he wasn't tried in anything I saw. Yeah. And then he lived in Madrid after that in South America. But he, he worked hard as a, uh, to try and get money that they had hidden away for the benefit of retired and sick army officers, things like that. What's the legacy of Nuremberg? You you were there. You got to see the folks. You got to uh, show the watch the trial. Oh, I think it was a great uh, a great example that uh, we set. But what I fear is that it was the only time we're going to be able to do that because everybody was on either one side or the other at the end of the war. Uh, wasn't too many months before the Russians began to act up, and you couldn't talk to a German officer more than a few minutes, and he'd say, do I have permission to speak? And you know what he was going to say. He said, why don't we join the Americans and the, and the uh, uh, Germans, join forces and, and fight the Russians? Well, you know, this seems stupid. Here's the Russians dying for your side one day, and you're asking them to fight them the next day. Patton thought it was a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, they were all for having us uh, join together and, 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 and fight. And uh, I think the Russians changed so quickly that it was a little worrisome, but no doubt, the time. Do you have, as you reflect back, uh, uh, a vivid image of Nuremberg that we haven't asked you about yet? Well, I, you know, I think that the thing that is relevant to your mission is the fact that Mr. Jackson came in over the, not exactly the protests, well, the protests of the British uh, and the Russians and insisted that it be a trial. And up to that time, it wasn't. It was going to be a, a, a massacre, a punishment. And uh, the th peculiar reasons that he could bring to bear had to do with his authority with the American government, American army, uh, to the numbers of personnel that it took, hundreds of people, to, to manage all of those, that documentation, which has never been done before. And uh, I don't know if it'll be done since, but I think this was the outstanding memory that I had was how carefully everything was documented for the first time ever. And it, it, it did indeed set an example, as Mr. Jackson used to say, uh, for future uh, adjudications of, of international problems. And uh, it, was, it was so massive and it was so 
uh, it, was, it was done so well, thanks to his authority through our government and using our army personnel to hundreds of people every day, uh, two or three hundred people uh, at work sorting and doing this documentation. It had never been done before and I don't think it's ever been done since, frankly. And uh, uh, I think that was the thing that impressed me about it. And I think that the, 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 the mechanics of it was dull. I mean, it took all day, the, day after day after day of, of testimony and, and then uh, various uh, uh, groups. Uh, and then yet, in the long run, it was the written record that, that uh, paid off. And then when it came time to consider uh, the, the decisions, they had a, a, a solid basis for, sort of for the decisions they came to, and I think they were right.